You're listening to Power Athlete Radio, a podcast dedicated to empowering your performance every damn day. Join former NFL pro and Power Athlete founder John Wellborn as he dissects the greatest minds in strength, conditioning, and more. Joining him is everyone's favorite coach and hair model, Chris, a.k.a. Tex McQuilkin, Power Athlete's Director of Performance. So whether your goal is to be the hammer, destroy mediocrity, or simply move the dirt, you've come to the right place. Now with the warm-up done, let the gains begin. Hey, Mr. McQuilkin, what's going on? A lot. Uh, We got a fighting-related question, and we've been in the throes, I think that's a fighting pun, of training Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighting and fighters and doing some training ourselves. Yeah, no. Well, if you guys are just tuning in, welcome to another episode of Power Athlete Radio. I'm John Wellborn, founder of Power Athlete. And and a 10-year NFL starter. Yes. uh, Nine-year starter, 10-year NFL player. Um, And I'm joined by Mr. Chris McQuilkin, a.k.a. Tex, director of training, also my co-host. Not just a friend of the podcast, but... Father of the podcast. <laughs> uh, dude, you're dead right. Um, so we have been doing a, a fun pet project here at Power Athlete. We've been working with some professional Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighters. And it's been really interesting seeing is that these guys, uh, you know, obviously they have their major events coming up. Uh, I think uh, IBJJ Worlds is coming up here December 9th and 10th. So they're basically in the training camp for that. So we're, we probably have three weeks from the time we're recording this podcast to when you know, even pre- present day, obviously, these people know we record this ahead of time. So uh, we've been in fight camp. They had a tune-up in Houston that went well, and then we had about 28, 29, 30 days before going into this. So we've been pretty much in this little mini four-week block of training for them, which has been pretty interesting, using a lot of PAP and a lot of uh, French contrast, a lot of speed, and a lot of dynamic work to try to generate a lot of power, which is kind of low-hanging fruit. I mean, I think you know, in a, in a four week block, it's extremely difficult to think about, you know, we spent the whole time before this working on strength, teaching the movements. And now we're in something where we're kind of periodizing for this four weeks. Yes. And teaching the movement, introducing the barbell. Cause these dudes, they're incredible athletes, but now we're taking these very fundamental general skills and introducing them. And now get the opportunity to express some, some strength, power and speed, which is cool. Yeah, no, I mean, we, uh, you know, been using a ton of med balls, um, using a lot of dynamic work. I mean, with flutter kicks and different movements, uh, leaning really hard on the kabuki transformer bar and also the belt squat um, and just all the the med ball work that I've always used throughout my entire NFL career and still used to this day. Yeah. And of course, bench press, bicep curls, you know. Well, I mean, part of playing good is looking good. Look good, feel good, play good. It all kind of rolls in. And, uh, you know, uh, people poo-hoo bodybuilding stuff, but bodybuilding has always been about putting on muscle and creating more armor and being more durable. So I think there's got to be an interesting balance of uh, training your athletes to be athletic and express athleticism and power. I mean, really, you know, power is just your ability to display your strength dynamically. So putting them in a situation where they can do those with movements that are both familiar but also unfamiliar. So we've thrown some new things at them, which I think allows for this athletic problem solving to take place. Big time. And we got a fun question from a caller to the hotline, which involves everything what we're living through as coaches right now, John. So I'm going to throw this your way. But before Sweet. I do, what's that hotline number in case somebody has a question? Ah, 929-464-464. 929-ing-ing. Zero. And find us on WhatsApp. And that's the best way to get a hold of us. Sweet. All right. Here you go, John. This is a two-parter. I'm going to split this in two. So I'll introduce both parts of the question here, but then we'll focus on one and then nail it home because the last part's a pretty fun one. Cool. All right. Part one. <clears throat> What's up, guys? This is Matt from Florida. Long time, first time. Flow rider. I just thought with all the big MMA events recently and coming up in the near future, the BJJ article on the Power Athlete blog and your work with the Six Blades dudes ask you guys for your thoughts on what the Power Athlete eight-week fight camp program might look like for the strength and conditioning pieces paired with all of their MMA training. And part two here, which we'll get to at the end. Also, what would be your go-to exercises for just making the most badass training montage for your athletes preview show? True tangible benefits aside, this is just about making your fighter look like a killer, and also the music selection for the montage is up for grabs. Oh, so man. have at it. 
Thanks, guys. Really appreciate all you do. That's a lot to unpack. Um, you know, when you think about an eight-week fight camp, um, you're really looking at developing their skills and hopefully upping their conditioning and really preparing them for the demands of what's going to happen on game day or fight day. Uh, for the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guys, it's a little bit different in that um, they go into these tournaments and they might have, you know, like uh, if they go gi, gi, no gi, they might have somewhere between four, six, eight, maybe, you know, I don't know, a certain amount of opportunities to go out there and compete. So for every one you win, you just keep going on, whereas an MA is more of a super fight type of deal yeah, where one. I got my one opportunity, my one fight. So for these individuals, it's a little different because they have an idea of the field of who's showing up but they don't know exactly who their you know later fights are going to be. Hey, I'm in this bracket. I'm going to be hitting this guy. Here's some of the other guys that I might have a chance. So they have a ability to guess. So it's a little bit different. I know um, obviously gi versus no gi is very different. Uh, you know, in the gi, there's a lot of push and pulling, and that's a bit of a skill. Whereas in the no gi, it's a lot more wrestling based, and it's a lot more clinches. So they have to do an interesting balance of uh, gi based training, and then they do a ton of no gi stuff with a wrestling coach. And then there's also the, uh, you know, just standard stuff that they're doing within their practices. Uh, so, I mean, they're doing some form of rolling every day. They come and train with us three days a week. I'd love to be able to get a fourth day and get them on Saturdays. But uh, I think the amount of work that we're doing, the quality is pretty high. And I'm really nervous by adding a fourth day if to see the quality kind of drop off. So I would rather have my athletes, my fighters, three days a week, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, get a really high training effect and a really high quality of work done. And I really just get that from Cal Dietz. You know, Cal Dietz, um, you know, we've talked at length about, you know, people have to have the base level of conditioning to be able to put the attention to detail and do a high quality work. And you have to constantly uh, look at your athlete's um, ability to execute a movement at a high, you know, just a high level of uh, proficiency. And then being able to pair some of the movements, because we've been using some PAP and a little bit of French contrast, a little post-activation potentiation in their training and picking the movements in such a way that they're benefiting the quality of the movements. Like, for example, if they're going to do some form of bilateral hip hinging like a squat, then putting them in like a cross pattern, like a reverse hyper, because we saw that by doing the cross patterning, we can effectively have a higher quality squat, whereas if we just squatted alone, it wouldn't be as good. You know, and then obviously the uh, the flutter kicks were a lot of fun to watch those guys do the other day, just to be able to see how fast those hamstrings turn on and off, and then being able to do some stuff with the shoulders. And uh, there's a lot of coaching involved as well because we're communicating and asking, "Hey, what are you feeling today? Where are you sore?" Yeah, and it's different for the individuals we're working with, which is unique. So we still have the expectation of the the program, but now we're finding the limitations. And this is the beauty of we're taking time with our athletes. This episode of Power Athlete Radio is powered by Train Heroic, the most immersive strength training app experience on the market. We've built our online training business by partnering with Train Heroic and helping us deliver all of our world-class training programs like Jack Street, Field Strong, and Grindstone. To learn which Power Athlete training program best suits your goals, head to powerathletehq.com training. And if you're a coach looking to build a business with the best tech and training, go to trainheroic.co forward slash powerathletehq. And now back to the show where this gentleman's asking for, hey, what's a f- eight week strength and conditioning program building up to a fight look like. However, as you mentioned, the base level needs to be established and built. Well, I mean, just bringing in a strength coach for an eight week fight camp is going to be extremely difficult because you're going to be asking him to work magic on an athlete he's never worked with before. And probably blame him. if Yeah. And then you're like, this guy fucked me. Uh, But like, let's be realistic. Um, it, like how long does it take to build a foundation of strength? I know when we started working with, um, you know, Victor and the guys from six blades, um, we spent a, a fair amount of time, a bunch of weeks, just getting to know them as athletes, putting them through different movements, asking them to, you know, X, Y, and Z step, squat, lunge, push and pull, um, all the different kind of movements. The big piece we've really leaned on is a lot of trunk stability, especially showing proficiency with the dead bugs rotation, all the stupid stuff that nobody wants to do is where we start. And then putting them into um, a training model, which is the universal athletic position and also the power athlete training model, the blueprint that we've designed, and then asking them to challenge that blueprint and then finding out where their limitations are and then going back and then figuring out why they have limitations. The one one thing you're going to run into with professional athletes, especially football players, fighters, BJJ, anybody that does some form of physical contact or something extremely explosive or dynamic or ballistic in nature, they're going to have injuries. 
So that's the fact finding mission where, okay, I know what I want you to do. Now, can you do it? And if you can't do it, why is there a limitation and do we have to address that? So a big part of what we're doing is when these athletes are, are given to us is figuring out, you know, what does an injury history look like, where the limitations are, um, what they can and can't do, what they can do well. And then we have to really work around that because there's a good chance that the majority of guys are dealing with something. Um, you know, one of our guys is dealing with uh, a real high up in the kind of more up in the pubic bone kind of uh, attachment groin somewhere in there in the hip flexor. And so we have to be very conscious. Let's say if we were doing a, you know, bilateral hip hinge squat, like we did today, making sure that he slows the movements down. So he doesn't bounce out of the bottom. We don't get some, you know, na- uh, dynamic knee Valgus, collapse, internal rotation, anything. Really. Yeah. Because what that happens is when the knees collapse, it ends up aggravating it, then becomes more of an issue. So starting with maybe some unilateral movements where we can kind of slow him down a little has been really good. Um, doing a bunch of conditioning with the upper body with the feet up on the assault bike has been pretty good as well, but really just coming in and assessing your athletes, figuring out what I need to do and what the, you know, what the basis is. Um, they're already going to be super dialed on their training. I mean, their sports specific training look, looks like they're fight training or their BJJ, the wrestling, whatever that looks like They're I mean, that's what they're there to do. They're not getting paid to show up and lift weights. Mm-hmm. So the execution has to be perfect. And then you have to be in constant contact with their coach. Um, you know, I text every day with, uh, with, uh, Shandi and the guys who are their coaches. And then, um, I go up and see Shandi a couple of days a week when I go up and train with them. Cause I thought it was disingenuous that if they came and trained with us, we didn't go learn more about what they were doing. And it's been extremely beneficial for me to learn more about training these guys from kind of the inside by doing and, and learning what they do. Uh, but you know, asking every day, like how's their fight training look? How do they do? How do they perform? Uh, is there any limitations? Um, big thing is how many calories. So I do all their diet stuff. I kind of monitor their food through my fitness pal, like almost like, a probably like my wife monitors my kids. Um, you know, how many calories are you eating? Are you low on calories? What does it look like? And I monitor that stuff every day. And the first question I do when they come in in the morning, cause I know, cause I check their, their, uh, my fitness pals the night before. So I know if they overate or they're under eight. And I even told them, I was like, yo man, I don't care if you under eat or overeat, I just need you to be accurate and get your food logged so that we understand if there's like, you, you know, you come in and you feel full or you feel tired or something, then we can start doing kind of a process of elimination and figure out where one of the, the holes are. Um, you know, we've got a pretty decent supplement protocol with uh, creatine, beta alanine, and then making sure they're supplementing with vitamin D, especially this time of year with uh, not as much sunshine. So making sure that those are dialed, um, making sure that we're addressing anything, making sure they're eating enough food, uh, making sure what they're monitoring weight, you know, we're trying to put weight on Victor or Rosh, we're trying to slim down a little bit. So either on two different diets, but making sure that, uh, you know, and then the big thing is, is, um, you know, the performance is one thing and especially what they're doing in the weight room is so important, but we always come in and I always ask them, how you feel? How'd you sleep last night? What are you feeling? Anything different? Anything hurting? What are you doing? You know, Rosh came in and says, hands felt cold which I know we've had, we've been cutting his calories back and we've been keeping them on a low carb diet. So sometimes when that happens, you can all, all of a sudden, um, you know, the metabolism might slow a little bit from the lack of calories because he's putting out a ton of work, you know, cold hands, all of a sudden his body temperature, his thyroid could be a little off. I mean, it could be a million different things or it just got fucking cold and he's tired, you know? So, uh, what I do is I listen and then I say, great, let's warm up. And we always start up with something that's very, very low, hanging fruit, you know, not something that's very neurologically demanding. Let's just do some basic isometrics, you know, with the trunk, dead bugs, pillars, side planks, whatever. And then we progress into something more dynamic and uh, start warming them up, getting them ready. Um, we saw, we, we were doing a bunch of uh, reverse med ball tosses today, you know, which was a new movement for those guys, but not a new pattern. Mm-hmm. You know, violent hip extension is something that every dynamic athlete should be able to do and knows how to do. It's just really interesting putting them in that position where now it's a reverse med ball toss with triple extension going backwards. And it was pretty interesting to watch those guys do that. Yeah. So essentially, John, what you've been able to, to walk through and talk through is we identify the demands of the, the sport, the competition, the stress. So the, applying the said principle from there, we apply an assessment for our athletes and we went through all the, the power athlete diagnostics. And from that phase, we started to write the program. Mm-hmm. And those, those are the three components. We, we talk about the lot in the, the methodology, yeah. right? We got to know the demands of the athlete. We have to see how far away they are through an assessment from the demands 
and then start to write the strength and conditioning program. Well, and, and you have to be intelligent about where you are within like their training, uh-huh. like let's say calendar, right? So we got thrust these guys at an interesting point at, you know, kind of Q end of Q3, Q4, knowing that, um, you know, uh, right after the ADCC, uh, which was in 20, oh, which was in September. So we started September, training yeah. just after that. Um, you know, Victor, uh, I think he was knocked out in the second round by points to Gordon Ryan. So he was the only guy that Gordon didn't submit, but he obviously lost on points nine to zero. Um, so uh, that was kind of realizing he needed horsepower and uh, we, we had to get him into a training model. But so when we sat down, as we started devising this thing, my first question is, is there any major dates that we have to periodize for? Because if you tell me, hey, I'm not going to compete until ADCC 2024, we got two fucking years. Now, all of a sudden, we go back and we develop a 24-month cycle where we're like, all right, you're going to do this and this and this, and it looks like a beautiful mind. But that's not how it rolls. You know, those guys had a warm-up in Houston. Nice they have um, uh, um, the Worlds coming up here in Anaheim, December 9th and 10th. So we knew that like we had enough time to do the introductory phase, which was just create foundational movements, develop stability, start to work on you know base level conditioning, and then we knew that once they came back, we were going to have a short one month to get them ready for the worlds. So we've been doing a bunch of really dynamic, high neurological, like just super demanding stuff that we know is going to you know hopefully get them where they need to go in four weeks. And then when they come back, now we'll sit back and like, all right, now let's get into this and start following the model, which, you know, we'll probably start with something like the power athlete metabolic conditioning cycles, develop that system, and then get into a more advanced training from there. Yes. So it's interesting that in line with the question here, this eight week, the dude's probably looking for a, uh, a catch all S and C program where we're doing our bit damnedest with the athletes that we got, but then our big, where we're starting to, to salivate is this off period following this upcoming December competition that we got some runway to put in a true strength and conditioning and athletic development model and get these guys going. So that would be the guidance there. Yes, eight weeks is cool, but what about the time that they don't lead up to a competition? Well, for for this guy's question, uh, for, you know, because we worked with Vitor Belfort um, for one of his fights. And then, you know, obviously Roth worked with Antonio Tarver on a number of his fights. And uh, a big part of the strength conditioning piece was to do enough to continue to keep them strong, keep them neurologically efficient and develop them, but not so much that it's taking away from the true nature of what they're asked to do, which is the fight stuff. So I know when, you know, uh, Tarver would do, you know, not only his, uh, you know, road work, he'd do this. I mean, he had a million different things he had to do uh-huh. and they had to kind of figure an economy of scale to kind of fit in where the strength training was. And uh, I know Raf was in charge of the, the weight loss and the diet, and that was a lot of yeah. to pressure on Raf. Well, it's a ton because uh, you know, we, he couldn't do the weightlifting <laughs> things because he was a big-ass dude, so he was getting the weight down without putting on the muscle. Yeah. So, I mean, there's an interesting thing. I mean, we're, we're pretty fortunate in that um, two of our guys are ultras. So, uh, for you know, our listeners that don't exactly know what that uh, means, John, can you please explain? Yeah. So they're heavyweights, they're big <laughs> dudes. So they don't necessarily have to do weight cuts. You know, Shandi had to do a weight cut for ADCC to hit a certain deal, but, uh, you know, Victor and Arash and the bigger dudes, uh, they are in this ultra heavyweight. So it's kind of a bigger class. So, I mean, but being able to put on muscle, I mean, it's, uh, the training, it's kind of an interesting blend, man. Like the training's important, uh, but the training is creating a stimulus. And that stimulus needs two things to effectively pour it over. It needs enough food and it needs enough sleep and recovery. And the one thing that's always been difficult, especially about younger kids, and when I say younger kids, I just mean kids in their early 20s, um, it's always a grind to get them to eat because they... Uh, they I thought eat. you were going to say sleep. Well, yeah. sleeping's a hard part too. Um, but I know for me when I was that age... You know, it's uh, it seems like it was yesterday, but it's obviously a little bit longer. Uh, you got to be really, really creative because it's really easy to like at, at that age, like, you know, you're not married. You know, it's not like you have a family. I mean, there's a lot of like intangibles. So sitting down and being like, all right, you're low on calories. How are you low on calories? Well, I'm having trouble in this and this. And so then being able to show them or mentor them and be like, all right, here's some solutions that we're going to put in place to help you make sure that you get your calories. And here's some ideas. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And, um, you know, being able to give solutions. Um, as you know, uh, I don't mind problems, but like if you come to me with a problem, we have to create solutions or there has to be a solution. I just don't like open-ended problems. So one, they got to, 
Um, they got to be able to give me enough food. And the sleep is another big issue. And I can tell, um, you know, the other night I know those guys went out and their coach texted me. He's like, yeah, we're, uh, you know, those guys cut out early. They did the Irish goodbye and bolted from the bar on the last Thursday night. So Shandy texted me. He's like, oh, those guys cut out early because they knew that they had training. And I was like, yeah, I knew they were going out. And they knew, and I knew that if they were going to go out and fucking hit it big, we were going to get them on Friday and, uh, it would have been bad for them. Bloodbath. Yeah. So having a good relationship with their coach, being able to kind of plug in a little bit. So I'm not surprised by anything. And then when I bring them in in the morning, uh, we always, you know, wrap for a few minutes. How are you guys feeling? You know, we'll have Victor and the guys go through the RPR stuff. So they'll do some warm up, uh, wake up drills, uh, another Cal Dietz thing. And then we'll kind of like, Hey, hit the bike for a little and I'll kind of see how they're moving if they're moving slow. And then I just give them either a lot abbreviated warm up, a little bit longer, but get them ready. But the one thing that's been really fascinating about these guys is, uh, they seem to get better as the sets go on. Like, the four sets better than the first set. Whereas for me and, you know, a lot of the, the more, um, seasoned, just, uh, seasoned, but just guys that have a ton of exposure to strength and conditioning. I mean, what we started lifting weights when we were 14 years old, seriously, these guys, that's not really part of the, the BJJ fight culture isn't strength and conditioning unless you come from a division one football or wrestling program yeah, back into it. So when it, we see the same thing with, um, beginners on bedrock, Right, the first rep looks like shit. Second rep starts to get better. Usually, by the third or the fourth rep, it looks much better, and then the fifth is uh, could be other way. Same thing with these guys. You know, set number one. Uh, you know, like they're they're okay. You know this, and I've seen them get significantly better, more explosive, more dynamic squat bench, whatever it looks like under the bar, any of the dynamic movements as we progress. Mm -hmm. And I, I go back to a story Dave Tate told me once years ago. Um, Dave Tate came and gave a seminar to CrossFit on powerlifting. And it was down in San Diego, and they invited me because at the time I was in good graces with CrossFit and we had CrossFit football. Hey, would you come down and take the seminar and help us AAR it, you know, just after action review and give us some feedback? And Dave made a really interesting point about they can almost gauge the experience of a lifter based off of what his first, second, and third rep looks like. If the first rep is perfect and then it gets worse over time, they know he's highly advanced. If uh, the first rep looks shaky, second looks better, and the third looks perfect, they know he's a, um, a much more green, you know, more uh, not as experienced a lifter. So um, with these guys, um, it's always amazing to see, like on set four, for example, we'll get their best work on that, um, which theoretically shouldn't be like that. So that's been really fascinating. Well, that's that's the beauty, and what I appreciate is manual resistance work with fighters mm -hmm. and. Uh, people on the bedrock if I get the opportunity to coach them through it because then you as a coach can adjust and feel when they're switched on and firing yeah. so it's many resistance meaning literally a coach or a teammate's hands are the the weight and you adjust through their range of motion according to their strength curve so it's always a consistent action whether it's a deduction a b-duction neck um, so a cool tool that you can sense their development and progress through one of the components we talk about in the power theme methodology online course, the different phases of a novice. Well, um, I also wonder too, if this is a sports specific thing, um, with, uh, I remember the first time I rolled with Shandi, um, we rolled for about like, I think we went 30 minutes. Like I was absolutely fucking dying. Like I was spent sweating. Like I was fucking in the tank. He didn't even crack a sweat. Like his ability to defend me and maintain position and fight, like he was so efficient that like he like he looked like he had just you know had a had a coffee and was like having a conversation, you know like every defense he thwarted everything this I mean I was dying, and I I remember thinking like probably one of the differences between you know a beginner or a white belt and a you know guy who's a fucking legend in this thing is probably comes down to efficiency when all of a sudden you're fighting people off and you know making it look really easy. So part of the thing, which is wild is, um, you know, and this is uh, something I really noticed about watching Gordon Ryan when we went to that, um, uh, that flow grappling event years, uh, with the, uh, with the guys from NSW, God, that was what October, almost a year ago. Uh, when we went, um, I was amazed at like how the speed didn't change. Like I think about like football and you know, what we do, there's like definite changes. It's like a hundred percent intensity. This he moved at like a 60%, but everything was real silky and uh, just real slithery, almost like just like slithery. Oh yeah. He was what like, an adjective. Well, dude, he was just like kind of slithering and moving and just real, like, just like, I mean, not greasy, but just like 
Soapy? Ah, uh, just silky. Silky smooth. Silky. Silky. He just moved really well. And uh, it wasn't fast. It was deliberate and it was continuous. So same thing with Shanji. Just like doesn't stop moving. Everything's real efficient, understands his positions. And so I, from just observation wise, they're used to kind of pacing a little bit, like being able to like economy and move. And probably the better you are, the less output you're putting in the BJJ oh, yeah. stuff. Whereas if you look at the UFC, I mean, dude, those guys are coming out trying to fucking murder themselves. I mean, with the UFC, what, 281 was on the other night. And, uh, dude, I mean, it's such an explosive sport. I mean, these dudes are coming out just trying to throw haymakers. I mean, the, uh, um, you know, the final fight with uh, Israel and versus Alex was incredible. I mean, the fact, like, I mean, just watching those dudes strike, I mean, they're kickboxers, like high-level kickboxers, their striking is incredible. Well, yeah, and I was thinking about the conditioning because five rounds. Five rounds, but, I mean, it's straight up pre-Fontaine. I it's know. like, uh, you know, fucking suicide, suicide pace. pace and today's, today's a good, good day, day to die. die. I mean, they are uh, like, dude, out there throwing huge bombs, big kicks. I mean, there's uh-huh. no fucking pacing. There's no chill. And you got to have big capacity. Whereas I wonder on the BJJ stuff, there's a whole level of efficiency. That but it can also be over in eight seconds. True. I mean, dude, uh, you get hit with some crazy flying arm bar and next thing you know, you're fucking out. So... Uh, being able to like, you know, like, I mean, obviously we're hitting a different energy system with those individuals, but I'm not surprised that as it goes on, they get better just because that's kind of maybe within the, you know, the, the sport specific nature conditioning, you know, whatever SPP of their sport. Yes. And so getting back to the question and we have a deliberate distinction, especially during our training days with the strength and the conditioning. Yeah. So conditioning, we close out each day. Um, and what's interesting, John, and I've heard you speak to this, that the the more proficient that you become, so the people that are going to recreational BJJ for their fitness, the better that they get at the the art of jujitsu, the less it becomes an actual like conditioning and fitness for them. Yeah, I, I read an article about a dude who was like lost like 140 pounds or something doing jujitsu. He's like, hey, I was, you know, like uh, 400 pounds and the guy like got down to like 260. And uh, I I think that's really interesting because um, it doesn't like, like, let's say we go roll for an hour, like the class is an hour. Um, You know, there's obviously you warm up, uh, you know, then there's going to be some skill development. They're going to teach movements. We're kind of go through the movements in kind of a low heart rate, kind of low, like a high skill. As they should. Low learning. A learning thing. High skill, low level distress. And then as you've kind of developed proficiency, now all of a sudden you go a little bit faster. And then we always finish with, I think like, uh, I think we did like f- three or four, three minute rounds. And so we'll always do some stuff and you just kind of roll continuous for anywhere from 12 to 15 minutes uh, just at the end. You know, so it ends up being like about, I don't know, maybe 70, 75 minutes for the class. Um, but I know uh, like that's for us, that's not a high level of like energy output. So if I'm like going there just for that conditioning, um, you know, maybe in the beginning when you're a novice and you're having to work your ass off, but by the end of it, you're super efficient and you probably don't have to really burn a bunch of calories, especially if you're in there rolling with some dickhead like me. Um, you know, you're just trying to beat people up so you can increase your self esteem. <laughs> yeah. I'm, just I'm in a kids class, just wheeling and dealing, ah, throwing fuck. kids. Uh, you know what I was thinking, as you were saying that I could, uh, I was imagining, um, you know, uh, I, I forgot who it was. It was either Charles or Antonio or one of the guys, uh, somehow like sent me some terrible, uh, what's his name? Um, um, fuck, uh, uh, Tate, um, Andrew Tate, like some meme of him where he just basically is pontificating and like, you know, like, uh, if you need to beat up little kids to feel better about yourself, beat those little kids up because you need to be a man. And he like, you know, all this. Well, I was I, thinking of two things. One, Kramer taking a kid's karate class, and the kid's getting after him at the <sighs> end. And then Daniel Tosh is a bit. Uh, it's fucking amazing. He's like, if you're ever feeling bad about yourself, go hang out with an eighth grader. <laughs> They're like, oh, I got a B on my test. Okay. I got a car. So, yeah, uh, class example. But I, I think um, the one thing that's been really interesting about these guys is, uh, like... I think that, that one, they, they embrace it because they come from a training background. Like, I've never had any of the fighters. Well, that's not true. Vitor, we did have to fucking get after to work. He was kind of inherently lazy. 
But uh, these individuals and some of the other guys that we've worked with, like you never have to get after them to do the work. Like there's never anything where I have to like get in their ass. You know, some of the football guys or some of the other guys like, oh, I feel sorry for themselves. And you got to fucking get into them a little bit to try to like get them to give output. The one thing that's nice for these guys is they have a, a ton of intrinsic motivation because I think or I, I know that they see translation in what we're doing into their sport. Because I ask him, how was practice? How'd it go? You know, just a, uh, you know, one of the observations that, that Victor made, which I thought was incredible, uh, that he would be able to connect it this soon. You know, we teach a universal athletic position, right? Uh, you know, toes straight ahead, big toe on the ground, knee tracks over the instep, uh, chest over the knees, you know, good balance, and, uh, you know, bend your knees, good position, you know, loading those hamstrings. And as we were going through it, you know, within the wrestling stuff, he found benefit in the universal. He's like, man, I was, you know, like as they were teaching the wrestling stance and we were going through the wrestling, trying to clean up stances, uh, the work that we had done and the positions we challenged with the belt squad and the squat and all the other stuff we've done with the med balls, I realized that it's the exact same position you guys are teaching. And now all of a sudden my wrestling is dramatically improved because I understand how to move through space, maintaining that position. Well, also props is that it, we're aiming to educate them using these positions and shapes and helping make the connection uh, between anything and everything that they do. So as the education and our experience in jujitsu increases, so does our ability to connect and make the connections for them in the weight room. Well, I mean, we're still teaching them about PAP and all this different stuff. So it may just fall on deaf ears right now, but the more we show and make the connections to their sport, the more it's going to see some value in in what they're doing, which increases intent, which gets us more out of the training. Yeah, well, I I always wanted to be let in on the secret. You know, when I was training and I was working with coaches, like I always wanted to be educated. I was doing it. Well, why are we doing it this way? And so what uh, I've, you know, hopefully instilled in all you guys and especially within our power, I think stuff like as, as we're working with our athletes, we're giving them information and educating them and teaching them to basically be us. Like, hey, this is what I'm looking for. And, and um, I always like ask questions. If you want to know why we're doing something or you need something to, uh, specific, ask me. Sometimes I throw them, I, I'll demo a movement or throw them into a movement. And then I'm really fascinated to say nothing to see how they figure it out. Which is a good test for a coach to do. Yeah. I mean, uh, so that you can always micromanage your athlete into something. Sometimes you tell them what to do, show them what to do, and then step away and then see how much they're able to translate. Like today when we were doing the, um, the single jammer arms for something dynamic, uh, you know, being able to figure out that like I need to load into it to get the jammer arm off so I can be dynamic opposed from it starting. That was one that uh, I watched and I was like, oh shit, I, I would have fucking taken up as much slack on that. But, you know, and then, and then we corrected it. It was actually a rush that was like, oh, if he does this, I'm like, oh, I know, I, I know how to do this. It's just interesting to see how other people do it. Uh, you know, and then the coordination piece. But I really think if you want to have your athletes be successful, they have to have buy-in. They have to understand what you're doing. Just like we sit down, you know, uh, as they come in, we, you know, we just write up the workout. I take them through. This is what we're doing today. This is why we're doing it. This is what the expected outcome is. Um, this is the rep range we're hitting. Like I know on our training programs on Field Strong, Jack Street, and the other ones that we do, we give a specific rep count because uh, the way the boxes are designed, I can't give a rep range. But like, for example, today we were doing four to sixes. Uh, if four looks good, you'll get five. If five looks good, you'll get six. If you do four and five looks worse, then we cut it. So I'm, I'm real big on um, quality of movement, especially in this time. So everything, I'm not as romanced with the weights and the bar. I'm more romanced with like the quality at which they execute the movements. Mm-hmm. So giving me four and then we end on a shitty rep. Uh, that doesn't happen. I would rather cut it before or force them into another, you know, hopefully see if they can push another rep out. Yes. And moving into the conditioning piece. Yeah. Uh, the we, con- the well, con- we utilize, we create the opportunity for them to push themselves without the loss of technique form yeah. and the importance of everything that you just highlighted right there. How that's utilized is through echo bikes, assault bikes. Yeah. So that way we can target specifically the conditioning. Yeah. So explain that a little bit of why we're not necessarily going into a cyclical model like some cross fitness and leaning on this to target energy systems with the bikes. Yeah. So I I really love the, uh, the air bike, especially the echo bike because it's, uh, it's got a big seat. So if you're a big dude, it doesn't feel like you're fucking uh, a little guy. Johnny can't get any leverage, dude, that little seat. 
Uh, if you get a big ass, that little seat hits you in the prostate and it's fucking brutal. So for a bigger dude, bigger seat. The other thing which is nice on the Echo is the handles are a little bit diff- uh, a little higher. So if you're a taller athlete, you can't leverage it as much. When I ride an Echo, I can kind of get down on top of it and push. And uh, I think I can create a lot more leverage. So the Echos uh, are excellent for bigger dudes. So what we've been doing with them is um, really just a, a really interesting Tabata protocol that we got from our good buddy Tom Newman, which came through Dr. Kramer and also through Boyd Epley, um, that they were using with the Rangers develop in, insane capacity. So we've been doing some Tabata protocols with those individuals and especially loading into them and really monitoring max wattage output and then understanding it down, uh, you know, uh, a degrade and then met being able to push them into a certain percentage of their first one. So we'll usually hit one for max intensity and then two through eight have to be within a certain percentage. Yeah, Max, and we were measuring that. So we got John and I on the bikes watching the numbers and tracking them on the whiteboard versus an emotional yep. intensity of relative cyclical movement. And it's also a great way for us to track how recovered or bought in or, you know, what they are because we have, you know, day one where we did, you know, maybe two or three, and now we've progressed into multiples where we know what their power output and we've seen it kind of peak and gone. I mean, you know, Victor's hit, you know, 1611, which, uh, you know, on a Tabata is pretty good. Anything over 1500 is considered elite and then being able to hold 40% for those others and then being able to rest them three minutes and get back in and then seeing what the output is and how it matches. So the one thing that's just pretty fascinating is uh, because they're pretty high level athletes and they train and they compete and they have good, pretty good aerobic systems, they recover quickly. Mm hmm. So my question for you now, you got your finger on the pulse. You can see oh, how... Oh, sorry. sorry. The, the one the reason I really like those bikes and the one thing I forgot to say is they're all concentric. So they're all concentric based. So there's no eccentric load in those pushes. So we're, you know, as you guys know, obviously the eccentric load is much more damaging. They may not know that. Well, maybe they don't. So for those of you guys that don't know, there's three muscle contractions, eccentric, concentric, and isometric. Isometric would be a hold. So static position concentric would actually be muscle lengthening and then concentric concentric shortening muscle eccentric. Short- oh what did i say um, eccentric is muscle lengthening yes. concentric is muscle shortening eccentric is three times more damaging than the concentric so when they ride they're pushing the entire and there's really no pull because when you, you you would get on the pull piece the legs are taking over so it's a constant push so with that it's not as difficult for them to recover from physically so we can do a ton of work with building massive aerobic capacity without necessarily uh, parasiting off and destroying their training or, or the next day's training deal. Yes. And the, the bike's an excellent tool for that. If we didn't have access to the bike, we'd utilize sl- sleds in mm-hmm. a similar manner uh, because the same benefit where it's more concentric than uh, eccentric. Power Athlete Nation. We're taking a break from this episode to let you know Black Friday starts early. We've got heavy discounts up to 50% off store-wide. Go to shop.powerathletehq.com and snag yourself some killer swag. A uh, question here now, getting back to our eight-week question. You've got your finger on the pulse. You can decide, oh, today's the day I can give these guys more juice on the conditioning or I can pull back because they need to recover. So if we were building this eight-week, how would you progress it in terms of the, the, the Tabatas? Would we just walk up as we get closer would we stair step so what would be a quick eight week solution for people out there that want a, a training camp style uh probably be three days a week um to start um but it has to start with one um we would do probably on day one assuming um but see here's the thing like if they're in eight weeks we really have a short amount of time they're obviously in a pretty big fight so we would have to really kind of work some magic but it's going to start with one um, and maybe two or three at most just to kind of get them prepped into it. But what I'm really interested in is seeing what their max output is on day one. For 20 seconds. For 20 yeah. seconds. How fast can you sprint? I want to check that max wattage from there. Uh, I'm going to write that number down, and then we're probably going to get maybe two or three after. And what I'm really looking for is can they hold within 40% of that initial sprint? Um, most people, and the reason I cut it at two or three, is uh, they couldn't hold 40%. And so it doesn't make sense just having a low, low amount of work. So we just gave them a kind of a, uh, just a, a, a little taste, a little dip, just a, you know, like a, like a little sampler. And then we came in two days later and, you know, we actually think we did three again. 
And then the end of the first week, I think we added one more and we got to four. And then we stayed at four until they were pretty consistent with max output was climbing and they were able to hold 40%. Once they were able to hold 40% for four, we added, we went to six. And then once, uh, and then we came back after they had done their, their deal down in Houston and they jumped on and I asked them, I was like, hey, we can either stay at six or we can push to eight. What do you guys want to do? And they said, let's do eight. So we jumped on, we did eight. And uh, that day, we actually, I think we jumped in. And that was a pretty good one because then we were like, all right, we'll let you pick pieces. You get to pick who you want to challenge. So Rush challenged me, which got Tex and Victor in the fight. And uh, we pinned the first one and then the seconds. And then what we were doing is we were competing to keep within 40% and then also looking at total calories. So we had a few different metrics. But the guys hit eight. Uh, they seemed pretty recovered. So then the next time we came in, um, I was going to be like, okay, we're going to rest three minutes. We're going to do a ninth one. Let me see what your max intensity is. And if it was within 80% of their first one, we could add one. Uh, Victor ended up matching his first round, which means that either he was sandbagging or the guy's got incredible capacity. Arash was in the 80, and then we gave them a 10th one, which was an absolute fucking bloodbath. So, um, and then... We rested, we came back, and I changed the protocol to go 60 seconds on, 30 seconds off for five rounds, just to kind of give them a little bit of a different taste, because I knew we were going to push to 16 today, which we ended up doing. So they go, or no, I'm sorry, we didn't push to 16, we pushed to, uh, to 12. So we did half, we did a full Tabata, rested three minutes, and we did half. So we'll end up stair-stepping, because I also know that uh, Arash is going down to compete in, or he's going up to compete in judo this weekend. We have Thanksgiving coming up, so we'll have Monday and Wednesday to train them, and then they'll go away, and I told them just to take off Thursday, Friday. Uh, they'll probably eat too much and have a bunch of cake and pie and stuff, and then we'll come back and have to like kind of be smart on that Monday and then ramp it up on that Wednesday. So uh, I think it's being smart. Like I think... And I, I'm, I'm speaking this passive voice. I don't know why the fuck I'm doing it. I know uh, one of the key components to working with these guys is when they come in, asking them how they feel, basically doing, you know, the visual check. Like, you know, how'd you sleep? How you feeling? Anything sore? What's feeling weird? How did you feel about the last one? What's going on? How was practice this? I always hit them with 10 questions because I'm thinking I'm looking for the survey. Uh, if they come right in and they like want to sit down or talk or this, sometimes they come in and want to get right to work. You can kind of feel people's energies. And then from there, what do you need me to do? I need you to jump on the bike and always go over there and be like, all right, anything we need to address, what's coming up, what are the dates, you know, how's the food, what's going on, just trying to get to know them and, um, you know, feel it out from there. We start warming up and the warm up's super important because one, we got to get them prepped for the workout, but we also got to see how fucking bought in they are. And what's interesting for those guys is they're like, uh, it's a little colder. It's 8.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. You know, all these other things, you know, we're coming up here on the end of the year and uh, realizing and more importantly, explaining to your athletes, hey, dude, we got two weeks. You know, you're coming back December 10th. Today's December or November 16th. You're talking, you know, I mean, probably three weeks and we got Thanksgiving. So we're going to miss a day. I mean, you know, we, we only have a finite amount of training time to get you ready for a massive contest. So being able to explain to them uh, the like sense of urgency and then being able to put them, uh, allow them to do some movements where they feel strong, they're feeling dynamic, they're excited you know, they're getting through their training. It's hitting them enough, but not so much that they, they can't recover. And then finishing off with the Tabatas. And, uh, you know, they were pretty sap today, but I think they left feeling like, dude, we handled our work. We got what done needed to be done and we're fucking on the right path. So if 16 rounds, eight minutes with a three and a half, uh, or three minute break in between. So we're at home eight week program. So the way I would do them is uh, for the first week, I would probably start with two to three. And then from there, I would probably see how they, on that Monday, I'd probably go to four, see how it is. And if they were able to keep, I would push to, you know, maybe over the course of that, I'd go from four um, to six. So at, almost at, adding a minute. Yeah. So I, time. yeah, I, I, I don't add ones. We go a minute. And then from there, once they, once they got six and they were able to hold, we go to eight. And then once there, I'd probably stay at eight for probably two or three sessions. And then add in the, uh, the test, the retest, mm -hmm. and see how far off they are from their initial max. Yeah, and if they are, now that, that frame of rest can be three to five minutes. On the initial one, I think I did three and a half. Today I did three right on the money, which 
that that was also interesting because that 30 seconds ended up being a massive difference. Uh-huh. But it was funny. Uh, it was wild because uh, Philippe got off the bike and at a minute he was kind of like dancing to the music. And I was like, oh, you guys are Same dancing. and son of a bitch. Let's get back on these fucking bikes. Um, so uh, they got back on the bikes at three minutes. I could have pushed it out. Maybe next time we'll give them five minutes. Maybe we'll see how they do at four. Uh, once they do that retest at nine, then we check that number. It has to be within 80% of the first number. And then they have to hold 40%. Now, the problem is, is that if they don't hold the 40%, it doesn't make sense to just keep fucking slopping it in there. But um, what I ended up doing, because none of them held 40 on, on, num- on number 10, uh, but they did when we got to 11 and 12. And 12, they got a little barn fever and started sprinting, got it, you know, got it above 700, so they were over that. And at that, I just cut it. Yeah. So mainly because Arash has got something going this weekend. If he didn't compete, we would have gone 16 rounds. And he was, and then then I, I looked to see what the effect is. So they've already gone through the the vomit phase. So uh, the initial Tabata, uh, when you get into it, you'll start to get like this like metal mouth, like you're going to puke. You guys remember from CrossFit? Yeah. Is that the Prowler f- flu? Yeah. Or Tabata flu or whatever you call where you get that cough, you think you're going to puke. Mm-hmm. So once they get past that and we get, you know, the lactic bathing isn't going to make them throw up. The next phase on that second one is uh, the leg burn where all of a sudden the legs feel like they're on fire. So you might have to, if you're going to be serious yeah. on it, you probably should have some bags of ice to kind of throw on their legs. You know, I remember Tom Newman telling me one kid called 911 because he thought his legs were on fire. Um, but, uh, Arash had a little bit of leg burn, Victor and them didn't, um, which was interesting. So, um, you know, it could be a supplementation, could be the beta alanine, it could be some other factors, but getting them to the point and then through that. And then eventually the pinnacle of this is when you get to the point where you can do max output, hold 80%, rest three to five minutes, max output, hold 80% or hold, I'm sorry, 40, sorry, max output, hold 40, rest first one has got to be within 80% of your second one. Then you hold 40% of whatever that number is Mm -hmm. rest three to five minutes and then come back and then be able to finish up the third Tabata. Yeah. Good note on that adjustment. So if I'm a fighter in eight week, I'm able to work through that 16 and and stay within the, the outline protocols. I'm feeling pretty confident going into that. Yeah, I think if we can get, I mean, from all the research and everything that we've seen within our own, uh, working with our own high-level athletes, if we can get to where you can give me three sets of that, you have 24 outputs within, you know, pretty close to to what we've outlined, their aerobic capacity is going to be so fucking high that um, nobody's going to touch them. I mean, it's, it's going to be, I mean, that's really just the superhuman. That's like the Marvel, you know, now all of a sudden I've turned into Captain America. So that's what we're shooting for. We're probably not going to be able to hit uh, in this, you know. I mean, obviously, within our time frame, it's probably going to take us a little bit longer to periodize into it. Well, we got them when we got them. So we're also taking that into consideration, and we are looking long term, yeah. not just this well, camp. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not excited to work with an athlete for six weeks. I'm not excited to work with an athlete for eight weeks. I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy to do it. But when I think about long-term athletic development and, pr- and predominantly getting somebody really strong, getting them moving really well, helping uh, you know fold the steel and almost make injuries that might have been a limitation in the you know in the past become just a fucking distant memory. Um, you know, making them, uh, giving them the tools so that they're able to go out and do things where people are like, "Holy shit, that's a different fucking dude." Uh-huh. Like that's what I'm excited about, and that takes a longer runway. So, um, you know, if we get a chance to work with these guys for 12, you know, 16, 18 months, and I know it sounds like a long amount of time, but I'll pose this question: How long does it take to get strong? A fucking lifetime. Um, you know, how long did it? You know, I mean, I started lifting weights at 14. I squatted 6'10 when I was 19. So I pretty much was squatting two to three days a week without missing a day for a better part of five or six years to be able to squat 600. And then it took me another three plus years after that, you know, with Louis Simmons help to bench 500. You know, I also went from a body weight of 165 to over 310, you know, grew six inches. So, I mean, it's, um, you know, matured in age. So, I mean, like it takes a long time to actually get to the point of being strong. Um, The one thing that we can do is we can really make them really efficient. We can allow them to express the strength they have 
dynamically and make them very powerful. And I think by that, uh, you know, we have an excellent model for that within the, the training programs that we're ent entering them into, understanding, you know, basic linear progression, how to kind of deload, where to shift it, how to move it. I mean, but all that really comes down to, one, having the athletes in front of us, and two, looking at the quality of their work and letting the quality be the defining factor, not just merely what I write down on the card. Very much so. And that's coaching. Now for part two, a little bit more fun and fast for you, John. <clears throat> and speaking of efficiency, what would be your go-to exercises for making these dudes look badass in a training montage for their fighters preview? Um, I always hate whenever uh, the, the one movement that for me I think is stupid because uh, I never liked it was the battling ropes. But whenever you see these fighters doing any montage, the battling ropes is always in there. And um, I, we don't do battling ropes. So I think um, for us, it's uh, being extremely dynamic in a back squat, being able to like, so heavy. Um, yeah, heavy, um, you know, also being able to do some dynamic single leg stuff, whether we're either using, you know, change or some awkward loading on the Bulgarians. Uh, Bulgarians. So something that looks more badass, but it's still basic weightlifting. <laughs> yeah. So like throw like six chains around his neck and then have him do a Bulgarian split squat with the heel elevated. So we're getting a ton of positive shin angle in the knee way over the toes. Um, the other big one I think is, uh, I definitely like the throwing of med balls. I mean, you know, if you see a montage and somebody's being dynamic and throwing med balls. So I think like strength is exciting to watch, but people want to see big, strong athletes move fast and do what big, strong athletes do, which is develop power. So just powerful, power based movements, you know, I seeing some athlete in a montage, just sitting there doing bicep curls, not exciting. Seeing a dude doing a fucking reverse med ball toss with a you know sixteen pound shot, or we did today with a you know fourteen pound uh, Dynamax ball, and seeing them fucking generate force and get that thing up, that's exciting for well, me. Well, on that note, I would go the lightest of light, so the ball travels thirty yards. <laughs> but then we got to go <laughs> but get they it. Don't, no, it's a montage. We I just know, have to I make know, it one. Kidding. And they don't know the weight, the uh, the viewer. Uh, I'd also lean heavy on some of our awesome trunk tools. That if I look at it, it looks easy. And then if I'm at home and I try it, I can't do it at all. Well, don't, don't you remember in Rocky IV when he was in the barn and he was like holding that plank? And do you remember like uh, um, his, uh, dude, what was the black trainer dude's name? Um, who was Creed's guy? He was like, no pain, no pain. And he's basically doing those fucking like I feel plank. like I, I this, it's killing me that I don't remember the coach's okay. name. Because so, he comes back. Yeah, he's in Rocky uh, six. God. Keep going. Uh, but when they're in the barn and he's doing that incredible, like, free length plank movement, dude, that's awesome. Duke. Duke. He's like, no pain, no pain. And then he does that uh, epic uh, clean and jerk where they're in the carriage. That's badass. So basically, we recreate Rocky IV montage. We got, we're going to need a lot more snow. I got an old Mercedes. Uh, I, I think, it, you know, we got the boar out in the pasture. Or actually, I brought it to the hill so we can put weights on the boar to flip. Uh, we got some really big kettlebells to swing. We got some metal Dragging ball. Dragging the Wade's Army truck. <laughs> chained up. Yeah. Uh, that'd be a good one. Um, I, I think we can create some good stuff. Um, but I know when I see training montages, especially like in the boxing stuff, I'm always excited to see the speed bag. I'm always excited to see him jump rope and skip. Um, because I know for me, uh, those are two of my favorites. I love to skip rope and I love the speed bag. So to, to actually see a high level boxer. And so um, this is kind of a misconception, right? The, the speed bag doesn't have much to do with, uh, with boxing. Rhythm. No, no. I mean, like it, it's, it's, it's not like something as a direct carryover. But what it is, is it's, it's something that's a developed skill that when you see somebody do it, you know that they've spent enough time in the gym mm -hmm. and it's an indicator. It's like a, uh, it's like a, a, a fucking VIP card, right? Like when you see a dude in the gym go in and he starts fucking hitting the speed bag and he's doing like different things, hitting it this way and this, and you see a high level boxer like make the speed bag sing, you know it's because he spent hundreds and thousands of hours in the gym and has had the opportunity to do it. So it's almost like, like you're there's a lot of dudes that, that can hit the speed bag that aren't professional boxers, but there's no high level boxer that can't make it sing. Does that make sense? Big time. Now, I'll reference when you talk about walking into the Baylor weight room, this is a number of years ago and you could tell essentially the training age of these college athletes 
basically by they are set up for the squat. Oh, they yeah. didn't have their routine. Well, um, if, if uh, the first time you take out, a, or if I watch somebody and I've never lifted with them before, and they take the bar out and they take like a huge, massive step, like five steps back, uh, you know, uh, which I always call the lumbata of death because as they come out of their last rep, they have to like dance it forward. But like if they get underneath the weight and like, you know, they're, they're shuffling in this and they're moving their feet and one foot comes back and this and their, their shit isn't just like motor programmed. I know that they don't have as much time underneath the bar. I remember one time uh, I was riding motorcycles with my boy RC and um, I thought I was pretty good at riding bikes. You know, RC, uh, you know, one percent or outlaw biker um, has you know, infinite amount of time on a bike. And I, I, you know, we were like cutting lanes or doing something. And I made some comment to him. He's like, shut the fuck up. I got more miles backing up to a curve than you have going forward. And I, I laughed at that one. And I was like, that's a pretty good fucking line. Did you just come up with that one? He's like, no, I use that one constantly. But same deal. I got more miles backing up to a curve than you go up forward. I got more miles taking a bar, bar out, out of the, the rack. rack than you got fucking running forward. So uh, that's a good indicator. But I mean, same thing on the jumping rope. You know, like, um, you know, you watch professional boxers. I mean, dude, Roberto Duran, if you guys even go to YouTube, you can see like, uh, you know, Merriweather. I mean, Tyson was incredible. Roberto Duran, um, all those guys were so incredible on the, you know, on the jump rope because one, it's a conditioning tool, but also when they bring the cameras in, everybody wants to see them do it. So it's a chance for them to show off. So they put a ton of time in. So like when the cameras come in, especially like, you know, when they bring in the, the media for like to watch their training. For one day, yeah. Jumping rope, speed bag. Um, you know, they'll have them hit the mitts. They have them, you know, the guy that goes, you know, slaps the mitts and like hits him and so they can show the hand speed. Yeah, that one. Like they'll rarely have them. I mean, um, there, uh, there is a mitt girl on Instagram. She's phenomenal. It's just seamless and effortless. She's working with fighters. It's so cool. Yeah. So uh, to guy to the guy that works the mitts for the fighters, there's an incredible skill in that dude where he just puts them up and he shoots the hands and they get into such a rhythm. So like that stuff, whether it be like jump rope, speed bag, the mitts, that's all shit that looks real good on camera. The mitt queen. The only dude that they would ever like, I don't know if you guys are, are into this, but like the 30 for 30 or when you watch any of the old boxing stuff, one of my favorites was watching um, George Foreman uh, and those bigger dudes hit the heavy bag. Seeing Foreman fucking hit the heavy bag and just seeing the whole thing buckle from every punch, like that was heavy fucking hands. incredible. But I mean, dude, they used to do this deal with Tyson, you know, where Tyson would like shoot the mitts and, you know, Tyson would do his side to side and then he would hop and he would get square. Ah, oh, so fucking good. And it's, it's because people want to see like the controlled violence. They want to see incredible athletes. Yeah, look at that kid. Yeah. But that's the whole Instagram is fucking montage. It's no, awesome. it's great. Um, but if you guys really like, like I geek out on boxing and I geek out on the training stuff. Like I've, uh, I don't know. I mean, like, dude, I, I still remember watching, you know, uh, Hagler versus Hearns when I was 10 years old. And like that fight was so impactful for me. I thought kicking was stupid after that. And I just wanted to box. So, I mean, but just like the build up stuff, but like now with YouTube to be able to see like, um, you know, some of this, I mean, like I'm so glad I grew up in the era when I did without all this technology. Um, but it's also amazing to have access to this technology. And I can imagine as a kid being into it where I could go in there and like, you know, you can, st I can go watch all the old fights of Tyson. I can see training stuff. I mean, you can still hear custom auto coaching. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty amazing stuff. And I'm so glad that it got saved. Final question. Music for the montage. What are you going with? Do you let the fighter pick? Or no, 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 no. We got, we got it. I mean, I'd have to go with fucking Palms of Sweaty, Mom Spaghetti. You know, fucking Eight Eminem. Mile. Eight Mile. I mean, I I think that one or um, there was a song by NWA called uh, 100 Miles and Running. That was another one. So uh, pretty funny story today. Uh, I let uh, Victor choose the music and he played all this like old 80s uh, gangster rap. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like uh, NWA, Eazy E, and uh, uh, Chuck D, Public Enemy. And I, I laughed when it came on because, uh, I mean, these kids aren't young enough or they're not old enough to be alive when this stuff came out, but I was. 
I was, you know, 10, 11 years old riding the car with my brother when NWA came out and he had, or an easy E and all that came out. So to hear that, but there was a, a hundred miles and running was uh, one of the songs that we listened to on a boom box on our football games as we were going to play different schools. So we had a hundred miles and running uh, would be a good one. And uh, I'd, I'd go with Eminem. What are you going with? Uh, well, I'll just stick with old eighties, the lost boys soundtrack, Tim Capella. I still believe. God damn it. That's a great song. Yeah. Or, I mean, Rocky three and four soundtracks are phenomenal. So survivor from both of those, I, the tiger was Rocky three. Mm-hmm. Uh, then they had burning heart and four and I mean, hearts of fire or no easy way out. Mm. That's a frequent in the power athlete gym. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's because uh, the scene when he's driving through the, uh, I think, fuck, what is it? Is, is it the Calicut Tunnel? I, I used to drive through the same tunnel where Rocky's driving, you know, in his Lamborghini that says yeah. uh, Southpaw. When he slams through it, I used to drive through it every day on my, uh, on my way home. Uh, yeah, anything from Rocky's good. Did you ever hammer the gas and get emotional like Rock? Uh, yeah, I had a twin turbo <laughs> Porsche and as I would race through there, I would fucking light it up and usually playing that exact music at the time. But, um, like, uh, I, it would have to be something. I mean, the, the other one would be, um, uh, I mean, obviously master of puppets from Metallica, pretty much anything by Metallica, but it would have to be like ride the lightning, uh, you know, uh, justice for all, any of that stuff. So that's what my training montage would be. But um, hmm. yeah, I was just thinking on the Rocky stuff when Rocky three, when Clubber Lang is training in that dungeon. Oh, that's that's and, the eye of the tiger. I know, but he's doing like pull ups and he's doing all that stuff. I mean, Clubber, I mean, Mr. T fucking nailed it. Three is my favorite. Crushed it. Oh, is, is three your favorite Rocky? Uh-huh. Oh, man, I'm kind of a Rocky Four fan. Well, I, I'm nothing wrong with four. I just put three, one, then four, then one, then two, then five. <laughs> oh, I'm, uh, I'll put six up there because he's got the Rocky speech and then Antonio Tarver. So yeah. I got the chance to work with him when he was with Raph, mm-hmm. which was awesome. But uh, yeah. And then Creed Three preview. Holy smokes, it looks awesome. Yeah, no, I I did like the Creed movies. I think they're excellent, and I don't think uh, I don't think Stallone wanted to make those. Uh, well, I mean, he was a part of one and two. Yeah. I can't remember. I think he passed away. His character in two. So I may be wrong. Well, they're bringing back like a ghost. I mean, like Mickey. You know, do you remember when? Uh, you know, all of a sudden, what was it? Uh, uh, I think you're talking about Star Wars and Obi Wan. No, wasn't it in Rocky Three when all of a sudden he's, he's losing and he like sees Mick and he's like, "Get up, you son of a bitch," because Mickey loves you. And you like that piece. At the Antonio, end. you're for, you're a PA guy. Um, Wasn't that Rocky three? Well, it has to be three. He died in three. No, he dies in two. No, he does die in three. You're right. Yeah, no, no, he dies in the beginning of two before he goes out and fights Clubber. So remember, no, Clubber three. pushes him in three, dies in three, and then he dies and has the heart attack, and, and he goes, calls him out for being a bitch for taking all these loser fights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was in three. He died. And then he gets, and then I don't remember the ghost. And then he goes to LA, goes back to Venice, goes back and trains with uh, Apollo Creed, which is there fucking is awesome. no oh man, and Adrian kills it in that one. Great actress. There is no tomorrow. Like fuck three. I can, now we got to watch three all day. Yeah, no, I mean we'll just get it on on repeat. But uh, it's, I, you know the the one thing I was thinking a little bit about the BJJ stuff, which is pretty interesting, especially with the grappling. Um, uh, you know, obviously it's super technical. There's conditioning, there's strength. It's just, it's such an interesting flow of movement. But there's one element that we don't have to contend for, which is different than the MMA stuff, which is the punch to the face. Which, as Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. And then they got to fucking figure it out from there. So, you know, there, there is one thing like, you know, when you're working with the MMA guys, um, there's an interesting balance in their training of like they have to take enough shots. They have to take enough hits to condition themselves, but they can't take too many that they're not prepared for or they're, uh, you know, they're damaged or they're not, you know, they've done too much to go out on uh, on fight night. So it's kind of an interesting piece, um, you know, and, I'll, and anybody that's ever fought like. Um, you know, everybody's sweet and looks good until you get fucking tuned up real good. And now all of a sudden, like, 
your spirit leaves you and all of a sudden your conditioning leaves you and like you have to learn how to fight through that and the only way you learn that is in sparring and being able to do it so i know those guys do a ton of sparring but there's never that element of like i'm gonna have to eat somebody's fucking knuckle for 20 minutes uh-huh. so um but i know in the fight stuff that's an interesting piece of like have they taken enough hits to get them ready but not too much that they are damaged or dinged going out there on uh, on fight night so it's an interesting piece man I, um, it's, I'm, I'm excited to be on the journey with these guys. Uh, they're high level athletes and they have never been exposed to what we do, which is really kind of neat to see how fast they progress and then being able to figure out some of the, uh, some of the injury, some of the, you know, the puzzle pieces of this thing and helping them kind of mature through that and more importantly, fold the steel around so that they're fucking non-existent. Yes. Matt from Florida. I believe we asked an answer. Ideally, dropping a strength and conditioning program right into an eight-week, not the best. But you can still manage. Ideally, you have that whole runway, the whole off-season to put in and install your strength and conditioning program so you can really focus and dial it in for the eight-weeker. Yeah. No, I I would be um, like if we were contacted to come in and work with a fighter just for his eight weeks building into his camp, um, it would be it would have to be a very specific situation. And more importantly, we would have to know them or know somebody that they were training with and understand where they were within the kind of the training paradigm. And then what we could effectively accomplish, what was the low hanging fruit? What, what can we do that's not going to take away from it? So uh, I'd be a, a little remiss to say we would just jump in with two feet on anybody for eight weeks, but um, you know, who knows we've done crazier things. Yeah. And I mean, we'd still aim to prepare them for the fight as well as target a lot of the low-hanging fruit athleticism things that John mentioned in reference to, John, your experience in the draft combine world when dudes get dropped in and it's combine only or some just balance things that doesn't prepare them to play football. Yeah, I mean... We wouldn't do that to a fighter. Yeah, like when I I finished up and I went down to train with Tom Shaw down in uh, um, Metairie, Louisiana, fuck, down in Kenner, uh, my agent was like, Hey, where do you want to, you know, like, does anybody want to train with? And my only question is like, where do the fastest dudes in the world go? Like, like who trains the fastest dudes year in and year out? Because I knew, uh, I had intangibles. I had strength. I just wanted to run sub fly flat like Kyle Turley did. And, uh, so he said, Tom Shaw. So I went down there and I ran with Tom and, you know, Tom was excellent about, uh, getting people to run fast. Very similar to kind of the podcast we just recently did with, um, Spellman. Yeah, with Spellman. Um, Les Spellman. Yeah, Les. Good dude. Yeah. yeah. So uh, his whole deal about efficiency, cleaning up technique, low hanging fruit, you know, punch and drive, you know, working on turnover, giving people the opportunity to run fast, to be fast. And uh, that was extremely beneficial for me. And I went down and I ran a pretty good time. Um, you know, where I did fuck up on my combine prep was uh, Tom's scale was broken. So I showed up, uh, I was supposed to show up at about 303, 305. I showed up at 317 Holy shit. because his fucking scale was broken. I was 305 on his scale and I was like, fuck, I mean, I, I felt really big. I was like, fuck, are you, is this thing accurate? And then I showed up at like 317 and I remember uh, the Dallas, or not, um, the Denver Broncos coach, uh, offensive line coach, um, had been reaching out to me beforehand. And when I showed up at 317, he's like too fucking big and he walked away. Well, yeah, they were a zone team. Yep. Yeah, they, they were all guys in their 275, 280s. And so I was supposed to show up at just uh, just around 295, 300, 300, you know, somewhere in there within that that window. And all of a sudden, I'm just a fucking meal under 320. It was way too big. <laughs> uh, I didn't, I jumped pretty well. I didn't run, I, I ran fast, but I was slow on my short shuttle and some of the other stuff. So I could have, uh, I should have been better if that had been managed better. I shouldn't have trusted his scale. That was stupid. Um, but you know what, you live and learn. And then I showed up and, you know, played most of my NFL career at 305, 306, 307, maybe 308. So, I mean, I was never, uh, even though that after that first year I got up to 326, which was way too fucking big. Um, but that was good. I mean, it helped me put on a lot of muscle and size, but then I dieted down and still played that season sub 310, which was always a good weight for me. So I think, uh, that's another issue working with these guys. Uh, finding weights, and I'm sure we can get on on this yeah, other that, one. Yeah, that, that's a whole different one. That's an excellent point, to just your experience and understanding of now finding it's not just mass for mass. Yeah. It's it's functional tissue, we'll call it, which we'll explore more in future podcasts. Yep. 
I don't want to belabor the point and beat a dead horse to death. Well, we got to, because that's a lot of hours, dude. I, I, I got a whole bunch of t- a bunch of theories on this stuff. So, Well, Matt from Florida, thanks for sending in a question to a hotline. If anyone's interested in unlocking some knowledge from us, where do they go to, John? Uh, if you want to leave information and get your questions answered and asked, or ask your questions and get them answered on the hotline, 929-464-464. Zero. 929-ing-ing. Zero. That's the Power Athlete Hotline. Find us on WhatsApp. And if you like what you heard here, give us a like and a review on F- Power Athlete Radio, iTunes, Spotify. It doesn't matter. Just give us five stars. That's all that we care about. If the five stars are legit and there's a good review, we usually like to read them on here. So I got to troll back through and look at some of the good five-star reviews, and hopefully we'll read them here on the next podcast. All right. And you've heard it here, Power Athlete Radio. Bye. Bye.